food as being the new black, so to speak. My wife talks about me watching uh, food porn, and uh, if I better clarify that straight away, that's watching all those television programs uh, about food, and they, they seem to be increasing, increasing. Australians are insatiable when they go overseas, visiting famous Paris restaurants, so we can tick off the list, yep. attending cooking class in Italy, learning words like terroir and provenance. Yep. Um, and so they're now finding out that we have some great food produce in Australia, which in fact, it often takes people from overseas to tell us how good our produce is. Yes. And, you know, you talked about visiting chefs. Yeah. And, you know, Rick Stein goes, how good is this fish? Yeah, the seafood. You know, the seafood yeah. that, that, we, that is Queensland right. seafood. Yeah, right. it's fantastic. So, um, and now with uh, good food safety, um, the publicity around Asia's wet markets and so forth, people are going to be fussier about the provenance of the food and where it's coming from. And uh, I think they'll be a bit frustrated about not being able to go and visit that little trattoria in Lombardy or wherever it may be, uh, that uh, cafe in Paris, and looking for what we've got in culinary tourism here in, in home. So there's opportunities for, for cooking schools, using local produce, uh, for food tours. Um, and it's not just good enough, I think, to say that we use local produce. We need to, and you've talked about telling the story, and we need, I think we need to bring it to life because it's not just a matter of saying, a lot of places, oh, well, we use local produce. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, well, local produce, I, you know, you, you know what I think of this term. Like, I think it's so overused, and I think a lot of people don't. There, there's there's not a lot of truth attached to it anymore. You know, we, we've had a couple of instances where, you know, oh, it was bought at Coles, so it's local. You know, <laughs> so we sort of have here in Hampton, we have micro-region produce, so, um, and that's very much attached to us. But, you know, that means that it's the region of, of your that's it's it's the food yes. of that region of a micro region and you know there's lots of micro regions in Queensland you know that are different levels there you know they could be closer to the beach you know um, maybe higher altitude um, I'm sure there's there's quite there's quite a few bits and pieces where that's concerned and then there's that other concept of the food miles so it might be a hundred food miles so that you you actually then have your region being within that area so it doesn't matter what it is i think but it's, i think what you're trying to say is it's got to be true to that yeah i think i think if you can keep it within within a region um and then you've got i guess this attachment so and then it gets back to sort of like you know that yogurt that was made at a certain dairy you know that is um, you know, from from this area, that's that's micro region dairy. You know, it's a it, it's yes, it's locally made, but I think that movement away from that term is probably needed, especially in Queensland, where our you know we we still um, haven't worked out how good our produce is in Queensland. We let a lot of it go to Melbourne. Um, we you know, and you know how passionate I am about keeping products in areas that. You know, you might own something, and we did a um, uh, a forum in Kingaroy a couple of years ago. Where I have to say, uh, you know, there's always plenty of farmers that come up to you and they say, "Oh, can you try this or can you try that?" And you know, there's always bits and pieces of stuff. And there was a farmer there that had these peaches. Now. Uh, you know, peaches are sort of like, oh, yeah, they're good. You know, we had um, a peach farmer working for us, an early season peach farming, um, Bella Pesh Orchards in oh, um, Childers, Childers. Yep. working for us in Bundy. So, you know, you work with a certain farmer. Anyway, he bought. He said to me, can you, can you come over and try these peaches anyway? And I, no, plums they were, sorry. That's all right, plums. And I can say I hadn't oh, eaten the good yes, plums. Yes, 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 and yes, they were from Cumbia. And I was thinking to myself, oh, God, you know, here we go. You know, this will be... <laughs> This is not going to be great. Plums aren't great. Anyway, I've got this thing and I've, you know, ripped into it and the juice is just like gone all the way down my thing and I've just like gone, oh my God, like this is just absolutely gobsmackingly good. I've never tasted a plum like it in my life. And um, it was sort of the, and I was like, where, you know, how do we, how do we, how can we use your plums? Like, how do we go? And he goes, oh, you know, they're all going to Melbourne. <laughs> And I was like, I'd be fixing that really bloody quickly, you know, because I'd be keeping those plums, some of those plums some, here. I'm not yeah. saying you keep them all, but keep some of them for your area so that it's represented. They're your plums. You own them. You know, that's that's your product. You know, that's your, 
whatever it may be, that's your pea can, you know, keep some of it for your own region and tell the story in your own region, then it's lovely. And if there's an attachment to say, um, Cumbia plums and it gets to Melbourne and then there's a little story. And then when the tourist comes up and they, they're driving through Cumbia and the grey nomads come through and they go, isn't that where those great plums come from? And, you know, and then make it available in that area. You know, maybe it's a jam, you know, maybe it's yep. some poached plums with just good old fashioned ice cream, you know, on, but there's, there's keeping that here is so important. Keeping a bit of it here because you own it. That's you right. own it. Your area stuff. owns that piece of, it's so valuable to it. Culinary tourism, it's that, that block that block of real estate is worth so much to yeah, you. Yeah, the brand is so marketed yeah. like I would talk about. Yeah. Now, you've talked about how you put your farmer's name on the menu, which is great. What about the wait staff? I mean, this, uh, how do they get involved? Because I think it's about telling the story. And I, I did some work for, uh, for Norfolk Island and I went to one of their restaurants and uh, it said uh, fresh local fish. <laughs> so that's lovely. Yeah. Um, so I said to the wait person, I said, so what, what oh, well, it, yeah, it was caught this morning. I said, so can you tell me a bit more about it? What's the fish? And uh, if you know Norfolk Island, they don't have boat ramps. They have to swing them out off the stone jetty and drop them in on the swell. And there's a whole story there. And, and she told me the story. It was fantastic. And I thought, yeah. you know, if you, you should, you, the nicest way you should have told me that story because it's brought this dish to life. To life, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we talk about, you. so here was this big transition from reef fish for me you know, traveling from, um, say, you know, coming from Bundaberg where, and, and from like all along, you know, being this sort of co semi-coastal kid, you know, the attachment to, to seafood's quite high, you know, it's very, very high. So you come inland a bit and you sort of go, no, oh, you know, here we go. Like there's, you know, how it's going to be really, really difficult to have, you know, that seafood is a part of your, or fish is a part of your menu. And then I was talking to Pip Courtney, who's a, a journalist for, for Landline, and she said to me, oh, Amanda, have you tried this Murray Cod? And I said, no. I'm, you know, I'm thinking sort of this got to be this muddy fish, you know. My husband had caught me jewfish, you know, when we were at Bam Bam, and, you know, it always used to be, you know, a little bit, a bit muddy. Anyway, we ended up getting, getting this, this fish, and we sourced it through a grower, so sustainable, completely sustainable fish. Um, a grower just sort of down off the range here called Nine Door Farms run by some great, um, and a lady called Bronwyn um, Neuendorf. And anyway, the, this was one of these life-changing moments. You know, I cooked this fish very simply. I had some cumbia capers, which they grow. I met up with those people with these beautiful capers and I had some little fresh-grown tomatoes and I just lightly pan-fried this fish in some butter and, you know, dropped a little bit of fresh dill into it and we served it up and there was silence. Everyone was just gobsmacked by this fish. Three weeks later, Jerry Damani pulls me up like in the street. I've only just sort of moved to Toowoomba and she goes, oh, like Amanda, like, oh, hey, hey, how are you? She can't stop thinking about that Murray cod. Like, and I was just like, oh, that's a, how are you going, Jerry? Like, you know, but it was just, this was this mind blowing that sometimes you don't know how good something is, but then it's that story that's attached to it. You know, that, you know, non, they grow these fish, they're sustainable. How do you get your waiter to, portray that form of passion well you feed it to them you let them try what we tried that night and you you know that super delicate flavor you know it's not going to be like reef fish some people are going to love it but you have to tell the story your customer you know the customer's got to know about the passion behind that dish where did the cape why is it so good well you know there's there's some well, it's some great friends over in in cumbia as well some great stuff coming out of cumbia that grow that grow capers and, you know, we took a little bit of that and we took some of this amazing, amazing um, cod that Bronwyn grew. And then, you know, you t tell the whole story and then the waiter's matching a bit of wine to it. They're telling the story. That's how it happens. Do they know the blueberry grower? Yes, they do know. Oh, that's their Monique's blueberries. Oh, she comes in, you know, every Thursday and then she usually comes again on a Saturday. And then she'll be 
um, you know, it's a, it's a really simple progression from them, especially if your farmers know your front of house. So that's a, that's a, such a simple thing to fix, you know, and that they, they know exactly, oh, you know, that's Chip, you know, he brings in the rhubarb, that's Joe, you know, she's the, you know, she's going to be bringing in some basil for us later on, or that's the egg lady. Where are they from? And then there's that chatting, you know, get your front of house to learn who your growers are. What, what is it about? Let them taste the food. Get them on the journey with you. Don't let them, you know, don't leave them behind and get them passionate about them. You know, I have um, one of my ex-waiters are visiting with us at the moment. The first thing she talked about to me was caponata. Now, caponata is a dish made that we made originally with Bill's eggplants. And she that memory for her is so entrenched in her head that she tried to get her restaurant at Noosa to make it, you know, because she's so passionate about that dish now. And, and she knew the background. She knew where the, you know, she knew at the time where the olives were from, they were from Jinjin. You know, she knew that, um, the, that the, we were making like a macadamia pesto to go with it. So she knew exactly how all, all those things, but if the staff are super interested and they've tried the food, it's so much easier to tell the story. And they know the grower, you know, they know the guy. So that it's grows turning the, the ordinary into extraordinary, isn't it? It's yeah, making that absolutely. big difference. And letting them, letting them bring that passion to the table, or even if it's over the counter, you know, even if it's you're, you're selling it at a fruit and veggie shop, you know, if it's, if it's a rhubarb infused ice cream that you're serving, oh, you know, you know, this, this farm's an amazing place, you know, they've got the richest red soil and, you know, there's just so many things that you can do to keep your staff on top of that. Yeah. And sell that. And then there's there's food souvenirs as well because, you know, people like to take Absolutely. back something that's special from that area. Yeah. So, you know, I've got a collection of New Orleans hot sauces that I bought when I was there. Yeah. Uh, and right next to a Mackay made capsicum jelly, which is delightful. So, you know, they're, they're things that I think people are, are special. So we talked about what's in it for the farmer. What about yourself as a restaurateur? I mean, what's what are the things that you think are really special? I think you've probably woven them into the stories, but, you know, I think it's important to... Uh, Look, I think it's being a part of that and, and watching people, watching a farmer actually, you know, either it, it's it, that you're, that you actually really value what they do and you want to be a part of what they're doing, you know, for me. And it's, it's of course, you're all, your produce is always going to be Mickey Mouse. It's always going to be so much better than what anyone else is getting. You know, it, there's a reason why we've been successful and it's usually to do I mean, yeah, there's a bit, of, a bit of skill there involved, but it's always got to be to do with the farmers that I've connected myself with, you know, and the, the guys that, you know, they're, they're happy to be involved with the story. You know, there's yeah. the Berlanti bullhorn chilies, you know, that, oh, my gosh, you know, do you really think they're that good? Well, they're amazing. And, and you know, going, oh, you know, I feel so grateful to be involved and I'm so happy that, you know, when they see themselves on a menu – you know, Berlanti's stuffed bullhorn chilies, you know, with Baffle Creek ricotta, blah, 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 you know, anything like that. It's so simple. It doesn't have, and it doesn't have to be something that's, you know, waffling on for, yep. for ages. It can be very, very simple. So I guess it for me, and, and from a business perspective, you're going to end up with a better product always going to end up with a better product if you're connected with people that are super passionate about what they're doing. So, you know, I know you'd be surprised to hear I know some winemakers quite well and uh, they have a saying is that you can make bad wine out of good grapes but you can't make a good wine out of bad grapes. Yeah. I think that's the same principle, isn't it? It's, you know, absolutely. It's, it's, you're better off, yeah, you're better off with that higher-end product. And what you'll always find, I mean, the thing for me that's always been interesting is that a grower will always be interested in growing you something else and they are... And they've always usually got something hidden or their, you know, their wife might be growing something, something else down yeah. the back, you know. Well, these days I, they're kids perhaps. Yeah, any, it could be anybody. And, you know, if it's to talk about Mark Hurler, Nat is a grower as well. So, you know, she would always have bits and pieces, you know. And then if I talk about like the, the early days, like with Dean DePoli, who was a massive baby Roma tomato grower, he was heavily involved with the Vietnamese community. So we always ended up with these just on the back doorstep, you know, it'd be, oh, you know, here's a box of snake beans and here's a box of okra, you know, the Vietnamese had sent them over, 
you know, for you to try or see what you can do with them. And it'd just be like, wow, you know, incredible. And then all of a sudden, you know, we'd have salt and pepper fried okra on the menu, you know, with maybe a bit of Janetto's, you know, prawn exo or something like that. There was always there, this super connection. There's always going to be a super connection about, you know, the way things happen. You know, the, it was saying to, you know, John uh, with at Peachy Distilling, you know, Cloud Lake, which is um, this an amazing um, accommodation provider at Ravensbourne. Every time something happens at Cloud Lake, it like something's fruiting, it ends up in my kitchen. They're not they're not commercial suppliers. They they're not they're not they're, but they are very good gardeners. Now every year I end up with figs, two different varieties. When the blood oranges start, I end mm, up with blood it. oranges. You know we always have an oversupply of warrigal greens. So there's always going to be this thing and then matching that beautiful piece of blood orange with say, you know, the peachy gin or something like like that or making, you know, a beautiful cake or a syrup or mm. something like that. There's just – and then it's Cloud Lake Adriatic figs with, you know, um, palm tree – um, black honey or something like that drizzled over them you know it, it's very very simple and then you add all your other bits that you need to, to need to bring in so we're at peachy distilling yes. i'll drink to that yeah. welcome yeah. We'll all welcome drink to that. welcome welcome <laughs> and we're we're here to talk about you know what what you're doing up here what you guys are doing up here because i know you're up to some sneaky business <laughs> <laughs> and some um gin which is very very close to my heart and basically what, what you're doing and how you're keeping it connected to the local region. Oh, well, on the farm we started off and uh, we've got a 100-year-old kumquat tree which uh, Ben's uh, uh, great-grandfather planted and uh, we thought that that would be a, an amazing botanical yeah. for a uh, spirit. So that yeah. started off us with the idea of gin Yes. and then it moved on to Ben who's a bit of an expert at uh, distilling. And, and I guess what we've tried to do is um, a lot of distilleries sometimes just buy in the spirit and flavour it up. Yep. Um, we've tried to actually start from Queensland products. So oh, wonderful. We've got Queensland sugar, which we've got plenty yep. of, though yep. we don't have too much sugar cane <laughs> here locally. Yeah. Um, we've got sorghum, which is a key thing that's grown here on the, the Darling the Downs, Downs, and that gives it a beautiful sort of grainy, even bready sort of flavour coming through. Oh, lovely. And um, we ferment that with yeast that's yep. actually made in Toowoomba at AB Maori. What a lot of people don't wow. realise is they actually make a lot of the yeast in Toowoomba yep. that goes to some of the, the best distilleries in the world. So, Isn't that incredible yeah. to have that connection? Yeah. And are you guys telling that story, of, like you have like a bit of a... Um, either on the bottle or in a pamphlet or something about your connection to yep. all these local yeah, yeah, providers. Definitely. So it's it's on the it's on the labels, it's um it's gonna it's on the website already. Yep. Um, and yeah it's a thing we're pretty proud of. Like our goal is to um, have local Australian made um, ingredients as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're connected to very much and I know that you've got a vine scrub here. What makes that special just in this area? What will you what will you take out of that vine scrub? Yeah, well, uh, the vine thicket we have, it's uh, 11 uh, acres, and it's actually unique to this location. And we've also got the largest stand of uh, vine thicket uh, in the region. But amongst that, there are a number of fruits and berries. Yep. And we've started to investigate potentially using those in a later version, later version gin. And one of those is the thorny black fruit, yes. which has got a very interesting uh, odour uh, as a botanical, uh, but also can be used as a cleansing or dealing with burns. Yeah, how wonderful. So that connection that you see, like from a tourism perspective, you'll that'll be part of your selling point is that having this all here in this area um, and that can, I guess then, you know, bringing it to a place like we have, like Emerald, you could, we can then say connect that say to the local say Mark Hurler at the Limes Absolutely. we can take in a bit yeah. of Gary's ginger um, we could even put some crow's nest soft drink and then it's like a very super connected area and you could come here and you could drink that and then that brings that traveler here and they get a whole experience not just it's not just one thing you could connect yourself you're with you're really lucky here to have all those elements that you can put yeah, together. yeah yeah well we've got we're in eco retreat yeah uh, we're also a working farm as well yeah so we run a herd of uh, cattle, 
uh, plus we keep bees. And uh, so, as you said, there's quite a mosaic of yeah. uh, activities for people to do. Yeah. And at the same time, enjoy our gin. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's my favourite. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much, guys, for having a chat to us today. I can't wait. I'm guessing that this is sort of nearly out this week. I'm, I'm, it's not too far away, but I'm super, super excited. I'm massive fan of yeah. gin, so can't wait. And, and I had a taste, what well, must be, 12, 18 months ago, of yeah. just some of the early ones, and if it's anything like that, it'll be great. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>with Cara from High Country Tours. Um, Cara, tell us a little bit what you've been doing. I know you have this van, this amazing foodie <laughs> van bus. that you yeah, that you take around to some amazing growers and, and there's a bit of an experience involved in it. Tell us how you did that and how you evolved this, how you made this business come about. Okay, so there was uh, um, some lovely people I met in the, in the High Country Hamlets group um, beautiful accommodation places and restaurants yeah. and farms and there was no one uh, showing them around so uh, my husband Brad and I uh, bought this van and we started doing food and farm tours. And what does that entail exactly and so who are you connected with in the, in the group? Yes, so um, farmers, so we have a, a rhubarb farmer, an avocado farmer, yeah. A uh, beautiful restaurant, um, M. Rod, uh, thanks to Amanda, and people look forward to being able to uh, visit the farms where the produce comes from, and then we go to to your establishment and eat the eat beautiful, the food. beautiful eat food. So, Carol, I think that's important because the farmers don't want people just wandering under their their, no. their product, you know, in their gates to yeah. say, oh, "Can you show me whatever?" So you arrange that, you Absolutely. organize it all, and, and preset it with people. So yeah, and I think it appeals to people because they can't do that. Yes. So they, it's very interesting for them to to actually go to the farm on an arranged time where they, can, you know, they can't normally just walk on and uh, get the experience from from where the food is coming from. So it's a, it's a, a really unique experience for the for tourism. And I imagine if the the produce is in season they've got an opportunity to buy some from there absolutely. as well absolutely they definitely take away jams and bunches of rhubarb and and chutneys and avocados and all sorts of things yeah absolutely from from the region yep. yeah it's Good. great yeah. oh, well that's that that was wasn't that wasn't that difficult it was just making that connection absolutely with the farmers absolutely and everyone was just uh yes come come and visit so yeah and it's it's just unique. It's a, a nice, unique, and it ties everything everything together. together. And yeah. then there's obviously different different um, tours for different you know groups where you know somebody want might, might want something a bit more boozy. Somebody want might want like an afternoon tea. Yeah. You know you might take them out to Bunny Canal or something. Or you know there's there's plenty of people that could be potentially involved in something a business like this yeah anywhere absolutely you can put it together quite quickly it's just knowing and approaching those farmers mm -hmm. and talking to them and mm -hmm. maybe right right the right connection with the yeah. with the foodies and yeah. away you go yeah. from there getting that yeah. understanding about what you're trying to achieve and exactly. you know, what, as i say there won't be people wandering all over their, their farm that'll be organized it'll that's be, right yes. yeah and small groups we yes. do small groups which i, th I believe the farmers are, are, are more interested in, in that small group yeah, um, rather than coach, yeah, coach a little lives. bit more personalized yes. yeah. and you tell the story as well absolutely so yes. it's all about being having having that knowledge in your mm -hmm. in your bank and then sort of going right well this is the story that goes with it as you're driving along yes that's and great. then when you get there the, yeah. the farmer tells another that's right and yeah. they get to get to meet the farmer that makes the produce and and you don't always get to do that you you know you might yeah, go, pretty much never in the city. Yeah, that's right. If you're shopping at a grocery store or something like that, or or, or a farm gate where the farmer isn't there and yeah. you're, you're peering yes. over the fence sort of thing. So. Yeah, amazing for mm. smaller regions to mm. get involved that have got something unique to offer. Exactly. As yeah, well. it's a lot of fun too. So yeah. you, yeah. you know, you can have a few drinks at lunchtime. Yeah. And we, is that we you drive you safely. No, no, not allowed, <laughs> not allowed to do that. <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. Thanks for talking to us today. You're welcome. We'll You're welcome. You. So, uh, publicity. It's, it's nice <laughs> to do all this, but we need to get the story out there. And uh, media's 
you know, always looking for good stories. And, yeah. and everyone does social media, which is fantastic. But, of course, there's still the traditional media in terms of the newspapers and, and uh, also the, the, the food writers and so forth that do stringers, do, do things for magazines. Can you talk about that a little bit in terms of how you get your message out and, and contact these people? Yeah, look, look, if you haven't got social media in this day and age and you're in this industry, you probably need to get a little bit of help just to get you started. And look, I do realise there's still plenty of people that are in this game that don't have it. Um, whether, you know, whether you're a farmer or whether you're, you have a small cafe, um, you know, whatever it may be, you need it. Now, the thing that people don't realise about social media is, is that it's free and it's a, it's a medium that basically can travel all over the world. Mm. You know, like a hashtag no can borders. go all over. There's no borders. And that someone in, you know, this morning in, say, Tuscany could be looking at, you might have tagged tomatoes, hashtag tomatoes, could be looking at a dish that you, you had put together this morning. So social media, you know, is one of those things I think, you know, you get on board with. Um, and if you can't, if you don't know what to do, get some help. There's plenty of people out there that are very good at it. And, you know, you'll probably have someone in your family if, if you know, you feel like you're someone in your family to maybe help you. And then once you, once you get a guest for it, you'll be fine. You know, you'll get, get on that. And, and you know how it works. You know, as far as the general media are concerned, you know, don't be scared of the general media. Um, you know, they're always looking for content and they're looking for things to do. You know, this year, especially, um, we're going to be in a very good position, I think, um, like tourism wise within our own, within Queensland. So it's about telling people what you've got, you know, so if you've got, if you know any general media, don't, you know, don't be afraid to invite someone to your area, you know, but make sure you're ready. Make sure you have got some bits and pieces in front of you. You know, you put your best foot forward where that's concerned. Um, but don't be afraid to, you know, invite someone like Delicious Magazine or, you know, they they won't, you know, they're not going to be worried about, you know, coming, you know, they might send a reporter up. You know, they're going to want some good stories yes. this year yeah. and next year and the probably the following year after. So if you've got anything different, it might be a an amazing prawn or, you know, it could be you know, some fabulous, um, I don't know, cheese that you've just developed and that you, you're really happy with. It might be some leg of Berkshire, you know, organic pork, pork that you've smoked a certain way or some this fabulous chickens out here that we grow to what we call capon size from um, Kingsthorpe. And, you know, gosh, you know, if I had the media here and I, you know, there was someone that I wanted to impressed and they were big you know knew that they were a chicken lover that would be the first place i would be going and making sure that i bought them back you know and make sure you're ready for them but don't be afraid of them but always put your, your best foot forward with them it's um and it starts it starts one day like it starts it only just starts with one thing and then everybody will want interested and you can open up whole new you know it's a, like a whole new world of of people allowing them into your area and saying, oh, you know, have you heard about, mm. you know, like here, you know, did you know we grow rhubarb here? You know, it pretty much doesn't grow anywhere else unless you go to Victoria. Um, oh, really? Oh, so, you know, oh, and do you know that we're making rhubarb cordial and do you know that you can buy, you know, this to go with yep. this to go rhubarb with this? Rhubarb jam or whatever it might be. Or you know, you, you grab what you have that is very much belongs to you and your area. Like for me, rhubarb's are very essential for this area. You know, yes, we have a lot of avocados. We all have, have these these very rare walnuts, but rhubarb is like, well, where else is it growing? It doesn't mm. grow well on the coast. You know, it needs high altitude and cold, you know, to survive. So tell that story to them. They want to see stuff that's a smidge different. They want to see stuff that's a bit unusual and that's really super interesting or your characters that are involved with food. Absolutely. Yeah. You talked about the, the soiree in Vandenberg where yeah. you closed down the main street. And I know you've got a number of long lunches and dinners here. Yeah. What about the, you know, and festivals? What about the role of events and in terms of promoting and, and showing what quality food you've got in an area? Oh, gosh, you know, that, that potentially is so easy. You know, once you've got those farmers on board and then you, you know, you get a couple of good got, I guess, good cooks involved in it. You know, that's, it's such a simple thing to do. And, you know, I've got many 
friends involved in the restaurant industry in Queensland that do them on a regular basis from, you know, down all the way through. And, you know, it's always been for me is, you know, mapping out a menu that around one particular farmer, you know, this is about, this is just about peas, you know. Then you might bring in another farmer and you might say, well, you know, this is um a... I don't say a bug tail um, ravioli that's going mm. on the side of it. And, you know, and then while, you know, when you're doing these things, you bring those farmers in and then you, you can ease, have them talk about their product. You know, you would jump someone like Dave Galetti up there or someone like Beryl Gronsky, you know, who's maybe doing, you know, fabulous, you know, someone that's doing amazing spanner crab or something yep. like that. And they will jump up and have a quick talk. Now the people that you've invited and charging them, you know, a good, bit of good. money, good money to sit down and drink and eat the most amazing product of your area. It's a look. It's a match made in heaven. You you can't you don't get much better than that. And that has been successful for hundreds and hundreds, and I'm sure thousands of years. About people sitting down to produce of their area. This is not new. You know, we just sometimes drift off the path a little bit, you know, with bringing in imports and stuff from everywhere else. You know, if they're coming to your area, make sure there is, you know, this, you know, this beautiful piece of pork from your area or, you know, you've got the most amazing water buffalo, you know, this buffalo that you're milking, you know, over here at Mulaney that we have a little bit to do with it and they're making the most amazing mozzarella with you know, make sure it's about that and, and bring, bring those people in and say, this is the best we've got. And we want to show you this. And I'm going to bring in Tasmanian salmon. And I'll keep bringing that up because it, it always does my head in thinking about how many places you go in Queensland and there's always Tasmanian salmon on the menu. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but please have your own fish as well. You know, please have your own products as well because that's what, that's what the travelling tourist is looking for. I've just got this vision of a caveman sitting around uh, chipping away at uh, a piece of uh, beef. <laughs> <laughs> inviting <laughs> inviting everybody, everyone to come in and have it. Inviting everybody else to come in. And... Hi, Jane. Thank you for... Uh, inviting us down today. Do you want to tell about what, uh, what you're growing here? Well, we grow persimmons here, so they're the, a new variety of persimmons called um, fuyu fruit, so sweet persimmons, not like your old astringent variety. These are sweet and ready to eat as soon as they change colour, as soon yeah. as they turn orange. Because I have tried the other ones overseas and it's, mm, no, it, it's, it's, not a, it's a bit pleasant, of a test. It's uh, not a pleasant experience yeah. and so many people say, um, I've, all, I've tried persimmons, you know, and yeah. they, I don't like them. The astringent, but, yeah, yeah version. Once you try the new variety, you're sold, I think. So you're great for a little chat today because you cross over from farming through into the tourism side of things and events as well. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell us about uh, about the uh, festival here and how that helps pro your produce and, and promoting it? Okay, so the Hampton Festival, um, right from the get-go, was planned to promote the local growers of the area and um, the local artisans, so it's sort of a two um, pronged effect, I guess, or purpose. But with regards to the uh, local growers, um, it was a it was it was um, brought about as a way to bring them out into the open. I guess farmers are down on their farm doing their farm work. Um, people are eating their food, but not putting the two together. together. So that was the point of the festival: is to sort of bring those people out and and highlight the produce of the region. Because really, we grow a lot of diverse stuff here: um, fruit, vegetables, and um, and the the farmers were not connecting with each other either so there's another um, benefit of getting them together also. So that helps build those distribution points the, yeah. the community as such. Um, it does it, it I mean it brings the, the consumer together with the farmer it makes those connections it, and it enlightens people as to a bit more about where their food comes from and how it gets from the farm to the table there's a real process there and also with regards to um, bringing the farmers together creating a bit of a network for them as well to um, um, it can be a lonely business farming, I guess, too, and, and to create some conversations with so them. I think that's and, worked really well because we've uh, visited probably eight or nine farms over the last couple of days and people have talked about how they're working with other peop people in the industry. Uh, totally different types of farms, but how they, they, they know the people through, obviously, often through that tourism or that local produce side of things. Mm -hmm. And some of them are working together and where they've got complementary products. 
Yeah, and and the other thing too is with um, the um, food providers. So the festival has a huge variety of um, restaurant stalls yes. and market stalls, all focused on food. And I think that's the, the secret of the event is that it, that's what stands it out from other events. There is so much food there, and the aim is always to get the food um, made by the local restaurants, cafes. And, and presented at the festival, therefore highlighting the fact that you can visit our local restaurants and cafes and eat the food that's grown in the area. Yeah, and I think that's also really important these days. People are becoming more and more aware of where their food's coming from, um, the provenance of the food, and being able to talk to the farmers who produce it or the local restaurateurs who say, you know, this is just, I've got this product from just over the hill or 3k away, mm -hmm. and that's all this travel before I've been able to prepare it. So, yeah, uh, and, and I think. Um, People are, I mean, they are being forced to know where their food is coming from too because there's so many champions out there yes. that are pushing that. And, and farmer, whether they're farmers, sometimes it's a bit hard to get the farmers to, to know the importance or to understand the importance of that. But I think many are coming on board. And also, um, you know, within the um, events industry or the tourism industry, there's a real push to... to draw that connection together yeah. so people are being almost forced to know uh, where their food's coming from it's a thing yeah and i think where people would go overseas to france or italy or whatever and do that suddenly they go oh we can, we can do, do it here <laughs> yeah absolutely because it's not really what we do they do it so well they, they've been there. doing it for centuries absolutely. So, it's just uh, part of life yeah mm. whereas i think we've come that that we've we've come through the whole circle and then we're back to looking at yeah um, let's hope you know that becomes our way of life now absolutely too, move towards that yeah so thank you. Thanks for your time. That's Kira. right. Thanks for having me. Good. Pleasure. <laughs> this, this is a really broad subject to food and, and we often forget people like bakers. You know, we've got some great bakers through the place and I know if I'm, if I'm going through Mandubra, I will stop in at the bakery there and get their double high top loaf, which is just beautiful, yeah. absolutely beautiful bread that I can't get in Brisbane, that's for sure. Um, so we, we forget about them. We forget about the butchers. Now, our butchers are fantastic. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll hear from one of our butchers, but, you know, they know they often will produce the, the uh, cattle or sheep or whatever themselves, or they'll know who produces it, so they know the quality that goes into it. Uh, we're very lucky that most of them have uh, smokehouses and will yeah. do their, smoke their own hams and, yeah. and so on and make sausages and small goods. And they're, they're, that's local produce. That's really important. Yeah, that's, that's precisely it. You know, when you think about peat out here, you know, that the majority of um, the beef that we're using is coming off his farm. Now, it comes that all comes down to breed specific. Like we know where it was where it was bred and who it was and pretty much their name as well. But you know, it's it that that's a, the attachment is amazing. And then he will know exactly what you need because he knows what quality I'm chasing. There's no way in the world he's gonna give me something that's a bit, you know, that he knows is maybe second rate. He's gonna put his best beast yes. forward and make sure we get that. You know, and the same goes for say to Gulabar pork here, you know, that they've been dealing with for 30 years, you know, a very, very careful farmer. We know exactly the quality of pork we're going to get all the time. And then there's attachment to this small, small farmer. They're not com big commercial mm. farmers and that we've got this very, very high grade. And then you end up with, and through Queensland, I have to say we have some super talented butchers and we were lucky enough, you know, that most of them do have smoke houses, mm. whereas... Some of the guys down south don't. Like if you went down the back road, like there's not, not a lot of smokehouses down through there. They get the big boys to do it. But all through Queensland, we seem to have had this influx of maybe Europeans in the early stage. And, yep. Germans you know, we, and so forth. And, yeah. yeah, we ended up with the most amazing smoked. I mean, when we ended up at Pete's, they had the smoker on and oh, everyone's sort yes. of like, oh my God, what's that smell? You know, you get there and you start like being woozy in the head. But it's... um. Yeah, all those people are so important and, and, and connecting with a baker. You know, think about think about how you can get a baker moving. Now, I think we helped another business in Bundaberg. Um, a friend of mine was very, very passionate about sourdough baking. Mm. He'd be brought up in cafes when he was a kid. He was working for, I think, the ANZ Bank. Um, he came and, you know, bought a couple of loaves of bread, you know, I said, yeah, you know, it's really good. It, it, it's really good. He started, um, you know, we started selling a bit of it. He then sort of, I don't know, started sort of just ramping up a bit. His now to where that started, Huge, 
had the I think you know they line up by the hundreds. And he sells out every Saturday, doesn't it's, he? It's and just... it's just intense, and you know it was just that little bit. He's an extremely good baker. You know we have the same in Hampton. I have a baker in Hampton that is so super talented. He's just had his kitchen approved. Kitchen's been approved. You know we've got a baker in the country um, where you know we're in a very good position. And I'll say to him, you know, what do you want to do this week? You know, don't always be the decider. You know, you don't have to always mm. put them in a position where you say, oh, you know, I want this. Stand, yeah. Sometimes it's nice to say, you know, what do you think you'd like to do? So he will like all of a sudden turns up with these beautiful boiled bagels, you know, and then amazing croissants. And then we did pan au chocolat where we connected with the local chocolate maker and he made these beautiful um, um, batons of chocolate, which was from... Um, his world, his award-winning worldwide award-winning chocolate, and so we connected this this amazing baker and this amazing artisan chocolate maker, and we put it together, and then we ended up with this product that was just like, you know, sensational. Yeah. And all you've got to do is you. I only have to sell it. I actually don't actually have, have to, to do anything. Yeah. You know, you might warm it up in the oven, but there, look, artisan-wise, you know, let be encouraging. You can. You can make something happen where that's you can happen. See a lot of magic happen if you let people let breathe a bit and and allow them because they're always going to be passionate about something else. You know that sometimes people get caught in a rut. It's like oh, you know, I make this, I make this, I make this. Talking about you know the big high top. You know, mm -hmm. you know, don't be afraid of breads like that. You know, you don't always have to go down that sourdough track. That I think one of the biggest selling sandwiches we had in Hampton when we first came here was what we called a doorstop toasty, yeah. which was this fluffy old, you know, white old fashioned bread, you know, that was about this high that we would butter. And then we would use things like Pete's, you know, crow's nest brisket. You know, we would have these beautiful soft briskets and we'd slice them up, you know, Anxious. a bit of local, you know, and we'd type to these toasties that were this high but soft, you know, crispy on the outside, soft in the centre, oozing with, you know, cheese and ripe tomatoes and maybe a few basil leaves and a few other bits and pieces. And, like, people go, oh, my God, you know, it's just like, you know, you know it's the best thing in the world. You know, it's just simple but it might be different to what they're serving in the city. You don't have to be like no, the city. That's right. Absolutely. You know, we don't. And uh, so something to wash it down, which is important. And mm -hmm. uh, some areas in Queensland, there's a few that have wineries, but a lot don't. But you've got microbreweries. Um, there's a lot of people putting in stills and producing vodka and gin and rum and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also here, you're luck lucky enough to have a, your own soft drink factory. So, uh, you know, they are all local produce made with, with beautiful uh, yeah. taste of the area. Yeah. Yeah, look, and I, you know, I always say this as well, you know, don't be afraid to approach these guys and, you know, support them, be proud of what you have in your area, you know, and if you've got someone traveling, they probably aren't that interested in Coke, some of them will be, and I'm just using that as a generic, you know, yes. brand, but if for us is like Crow's Nest Soft Drink, you know, you can have, you know, a bottle of Portello or, you know, ginger beer or something, it's made here. You know, it's a very, very different thing. And, you know, I think about beers and, you know, we were quite heavily involved with Bagara Brewing when it started and um, Baffle Creek Brewing. Um, and they, Baffle Creek used to make this thing called a smoky bock called Capricornia. Now it's a big beer, you know, I think it's about 9% alcohol. Um, it's, you know, there's a little bit of sweetness about it. So how we how we move something like that into our menu is that we used to make like a brioche toast for breakfast. We would take the Capricornia would go into the brioche mist so you get this really beautiful multi. Then we would toast that, you know, and we had some onions that we slow cooked. We'd take a sausage that the local butcher had, I'd spoken to him about, and he's made me a special kind of sausage to go on that. We'd taken some beetroots from... Darren, my local beetroot grower, you know, we made a beetroot relish, we poached some local eggs, and then we had a, you know, a dish that was legendary. Amazing. And it was all based on Capricornia, the smoky bock, you know, which was from from a brew house, you know, it was from a from a brewing company in our area. It doesn't mean that you actually you can incorporate that into your menu, you know, that doesn't mean that you have to be exactly there. Mm. I mean, Sabine was asking me, my daughter's who's a chef as well, was asking me for gin last week because she wanted to make, you know, gin and tonic tarts and to go on the counter. And Peachy 
brewing will be ideal for that, you know, because that then adds that product into, and it'll be lime instead of lemon. Yep. You know, we start, then we and start to grab. And and local, yeah, yes, And flavors. then we join those products together. So we've got Herlars limes, we've got the thing, and then you could probably finish it up with, you know, a layer of, you know, rhubarb if you wanted to. So you've just got to keep super flexible, really, really flexible. So... In terms of selling the produce, there are so many different ways. We've talked about restaurants. We've talked about uh, ways that in some areas like the Sunshine Coast, some of the smaller supermarkets are stocking a lot of local produce, which mm. is fantastic yeah. to see. And we've seen that in Bundaberg. You know, the, yeah. often smaller supermarkets will do that and have an area set aside. You've got uh, some areas, including Nakai, which have great weekly uh, food markets, which is great to see. But if they haven't, there are the... Uh, Farmgate sales, where you've got the honesty boxes outside places, and it's it's great produce. So there's yeah. there's so many different ways that the visitor and the local, for the matter, we've talked about this in the connection with the with the visitor, but it's great for the locals as well. Oh, of course, you know, imagine being able to pick up like you know local, you know, if you're from say say Toowoomba, I'm sort of thinking, you know, the markets in there are incredible, you know, where but there's a probably a congregation of local bakers and. Um, olives and you know all sorts of bits and pieces and then sort of like you know the asian community brings mm. bits and pieces where they're hand making dumplings and but there's always that that value add thing you know if you're if you've got passion for it could you be making something else or you know yep. can someone else take them to the market for you or you know and then there's just that that super connection again you know and then you're making that available to the local and it's at premium usually and then we also talked to mark about you know these these beautiful what we call premium limes which the which the okay i guess cosmo has been a little bit you know we've had these sort of harder what they call Bright premium green, lime yeah. very very hard no juice in it and we look for a lime that's actually starting to turn yellow because we know that it's starting to ripen. So anybody in Toowoomba at the moment that Mark's taking, say, I don't know, um, say 100 boxes of limes to market at the moment in Toowoomba, you know, most of those are just starting to turn. How do you ever go back from having that premium product? You know, we know it's a premium product. Then, you know, it's just teaching the general public that that's the best lime, not that little hard green thing that has nothing in it. You know, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's an incredible thing, really. Right. Well, thanks, Amanda. I think we've uh, we've covered a lot of territory today, mm. and hopefully the people that are watching and listening to this uh, will will get some great ideas from what we're talking about, and uh, there'll be a way of uh, asking us some questions and getting some feedback, uh, which will be shown at the end of the show. So, Pete, I go around the state a lot, uh, talking to people about local produce and uh, so on, and often people forget the butchers. Mm. So. Talk to me, because I know that you have a lot of local produce in your store here. Yeah, we base this business on using as much local produce as possible. Um, some of it we breed and feed ourselves, um, cattle and sheep. We put all our own cattle and sheep through the shop. Um, we also have a business relationship with a local producer, a pork producer down in Tagulawa, who breeds and feeds exclusively for us. So all, most, virtually all our pork through the shop is from him, um, from his farm. Um, we work as closely as possible with local producers, um, putting their product through our, our store. So you know where your supplies come from? That's the whole idea. We have all that provenance that goes with yeah. working locally and relationships with other like-minded family-owned businesses. And that word provenance, I think, is going to uh, come around more and more and people are uh, concerned about where their food comes from, the food supply. I think customers are asking for it more and more as time goes on. Now, small goods and smokehouses, that's something that we're pretty fortunate in Queensland, I think, to have a lot of the smaller country butchers to have them, which gives you your particular flavours and your secret mixes of herbs and spices <laughs> that go into them. And Tell local me, sawdust. And local sawdust, there we go. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, we make all our own um, ham and bacon um, and salamis and small goods um, here in store on these premises right here in Crozens. Um, using, as I said, local product, um, using to give our unique flavour some local sawdust, some of it from my own farm, which is um, 13 kilometres away from here, so we can we can add that uniqueness to our product. So, 
Well, that's really important, and I think so, that we need to get the message across to people who've got cafes and restaurants and whatever, that, that their butcher is a very good source of local produce for them. Indeed, and usually you'll find that the butcher can work closely with restaurants and cafes and produce some signature things that are unique to the area. Fantastic. I mean, that's a great thing to touch on is a signature dish or a signature sausage or whatever it may be Indeed. in terms of that. And do you see, uh, I mean, I look in the window of your shop here and you've got some great produce as well, that you've got pies and things like that. Um, so do you see people coming in here and asking for particular things? They do, yeah. Um, the locals just love what we make locally and um, some, quite a number of the tourists take a little sample of Crow's Nest away with them. Um, and then we have people that, that make trips, special trips up to, come back. to buy some of our um, ham and bacon, for example. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Pete, for, My for doing that. Great. Thank you. So something special here in Crow's Nest is their own uh, cordial company. Uh, how long has that been running here for? Uh, the business has been alive since 1903. Amazing. Yeah, so we're on 117 years now. Good. Yeah. And, and all local produce, all made here? Everything in, in the place is made here by two of us. Right. So we do the 16 uh, flavours of soft drink, including soda water, and currently about 34 flavours of uh, flavoured syrup. And what would be the most favourite ones you've got amongst them? Sars and Sars. Sars and Sars. Queenslanders love their Sars, don't they? Our, uh, yep, yep. Uh, so our Sars soft drinks is our biggest seller. It actually sells nearly twice as much as our second biggest seller. Uh, in the syrups, Sars is also a bigger seller. Right. Mm. So do you have any, we, this is a, a project where we're talking about the value not only of local produce but of visitors tasting and trying and buying and do you have a lot of visitors come in here and do that? This shop front here was uh, establishing itself as a bit of a tourist destination. So we've had people from all over Australia. Uh, this, this season at the moment, typically we would have grey nomads, you know, three or four groups a day coming through. Uh, we, we've, we have in the past done bus tours, coach tours, up to 60 people. Uh, we're happy to show people through our, our workings out the back there, our old equipment. And, um, Fantastic. Yeah, so, so tourism has been a significant part of this business. It's, you know, for me, it's so important to have the connection to you guys. And I, a little story that happened on the weekend was a man was travelling through, um, and he said, "Oh, can I have can I have a bottle of Coke?" And I was like, "Oh, you know, we're not we're not big on sort of selling the big multinational stuff." I said, "But we do have a range of locally made crow's nest, you know, six crow's nest soft drinks six minutes down the road." And I said, "They're like old school, traditional, real soft drinks, like you would have had when you were a kid." And he went, "Oh." Gee, I haven't, I haven't had a soft drink like that in years. And he goes, oh, I'll have a double sass. Like, that was, he, that was straight his go-to, and yeah. he was, it was all over, Rover. So, and he was like, he had kids with him, and that was this whole trip down memory lane. It was like, he forgot about the Coke. Mm -hmm. It was all over. And then there was this connection that you're a part of the area that we're in, and that it's a part of us. Yeah. You know, it's a part yeah. of our selling sphere that we involve um, this amazing soft drink that is grown, uh, that is basically here in this area, that's born and bred in Crow's Nest and is made here and is a part of what we do. And if you have a milkshake, it's Crow's Nest. You know, if, if you're having a soft drink, you know, if you want to have a good old fashioned, you know, lime and, you know, ice cream spider, it's the story's about you guys, but that's a part of us now. So that, I just, that's what it's very, very important for that to be and to tell that story to the customer that you that you're that you're here and that you're a part of us and that's how we operate. Yeah, I, look, I agree with you, Amanda. A, a lot of people tell us that they love the story yeah. and they want to support local. Yeah, and then there's that tourism aspect too. If you want to come, if you come to Crow's Nest, that this is a major draw card for tourism. For you sure. step into here and there's this sweet aroma that sort of like lulls you into this you know, this sort of like, sort of oozy sort of feeling in your yeah, head. Yeah, yeah. And then you walk in here and then if you had soft drinks when you are a kid and maybe, you know, you're a little bit older, um, 
you have it. It's like a walk down memory lane, and every soft drink is a walk down memory lane for some yep. people. And even milkshake flavors. I just said to James before, oh, custard. Like custard milkshake, who would have ever thought, but I think it's just such an important aspect. And yeah. I, for me, like it's just such a, an important part of what we do. So, yeah. Yep, thanks. I agree.